Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. I do hope that you are having a good time. This is another in a series of lectures on critical thinking. In this lecture, I want to start looking at what we call inductive arguments. So first, we're going to review what we've looked at so far with deductive arguments, and then we are going to move into the content. So, some of the key concepts that we saw when looking at deductive arguments were the deductive forms. So we had modus ponens, modus tollens, disjunctive syllogism, hypothetical syllogism, and dilemma. So if you don't remember these forms, please feel free to look at a previous flip. I'm just going to give you a couple of them. Look them now, so modus ponens, we have A, we have A implies B, and from this we are able to say B. Now, For modus tollens, we have A implies B, we have not B, and then we can conclude from that, not A. Disjunctive syllogism. So a disjunctive syllogism, we have A or B, we have not A, and from this we can imply B. So there's also about four other operators that we used in this class. There's conjunction, which means and, there's disjunction, which means or, there's a conditional, which is if, then, and there's negation, which roughly speaking means not. Finally, the most important concept that we worked with was the concept of validity. Now, validity has to do with following rules. And the reason validity is valuable is because validity is truth preserving. This means if we start with true premises and we have valid form, we will get a true conclusion. We can test for validity either by using truth tables or inference rules. Now, when we have an argument that both has true premises and a valid form, we are looking at a sound argument. So that is called soundness. Now, let's review. With deductive arguments, a deductive argument can be valid or invalid. A statement can be true or false. So again, statements cannot be valid or invalid. Arguments cannot be true or false. Whether a claim is true or false looks at whether a statement describes what happens in the world. So something like, it is minus 8 degrees centigrade outside right now. This is either true or it is false. Something like, if it is a carrot, then I don't like it. It is a carrot, therefore I don't like it. This is an entire argument. So this is either valid or invalid. In this case, it's valid. And we should remember it all the way back from the previous slide, it's modus ponens. If you combine true premises, things that are actually the case, and a valid argument, which means one that is truth-preserving, then you arrive at soundness, which is true premises and a valid form, and this will guarantee you a true conclusion. This is the really valuable feature of deductive arguments. This is what we're looking for. So now I want to talk to you about a new form of arguments. So up until now, we focused on general rules for arguments and on deductive forms. In a deductive argument, a good form is valid, a bad form is invalid. In a deductive argument, if it has a good form plus true premises, the conclusion must be true. And this is validity. Limitations. One limitation is every statement in a deductive argument, at least in the basic ones we are looking at, must be either true or false, and we're limited to a small set of operators. Another valuable feature, it's never a guess. It always depends on whether we followed the rules. If we did, we can guarantee if we had true premises, we have a true conclusion. Finally, if we want to look at the name in Japanese, it's an en ekiteki ronsho. So let's compare that with the type we're going to be looking at now. The other type of argument is what is called an inductive argument. In Japanese, this is a kinoteki ironsho. So, inductive arguments are not valid or invalid. Instead, they are strong or weak. Now, in an in inductive argument, no matter how good our premises are, no matter how good our ideas are, 
it is the case that it's possible for the conclusion to still be false. Now, this can accept partial values. So that means that we can have something be half the way there. So we could say that someone is almost 2 meters tall. We can say that the average is 150 or 0.5. We can do all sorts of things that are partial or fractions. We can do it in any way we want. It's very free. It's always going to really be a type of guess. It's always going to be something where we don't have a final answer as to why this is the case. Generalizations and arguments by analogy and they're going to share several common features. These features are, the argument is either strong or weak. The argument tells us a conclusion that is probable. So probable means it's most likely the case. That the chances that this is the case are good. It doesn't mean it must be the case. This means that the conclusion can still be false even when all of the premises are true. So let me emphasize that. So in a deductive argument, the conclusion must be true if all of the premises are true. In an inductive argument, the conclusion can be false even if all of the premises are true. Now, these arguments also tend to depend on our senses and on data. So some of what we're going to look at has to do with managing data. So sense being truth preserving, means that we can guarantee a true conclusion if the premises are true, it's very handy. But, inductive arguments are not truth preserving. Moreover, there aren't clear rules in quite the same way. So deductive arguments can be described as valid or invalid. But for inductive arguments, we're just going to talk about them as strong or weak. In this case, strong means the likelihood is high that our argument supports the conclusion. Weak means that the likelihood is low, or there are reasons to doubt that our argument proves the conclusion we want. The way that we can tell is that inductive arguments have many rules, and they also involve our judgment. In contrast, deductive arguments follow a short rule list. So we looked at them in our review section. There's not very many of them. If you're using truth tables, we're only looking at four operators. You can make it six if you want. We only looked at four in class. If you are looking at inference rules, you could look at maybe 18. But at the most, there's maybe 15 or 20 rules. For inductive arguments, there's an infinite number of possible rules and variations, and every time, we're going to have to use our judgment to decide if it's good or not. So, let's see. This is one example of an inductive argument. Ah, sorry. So one of the problems when doing inductive arguments is that we have to make a judgment about whether or not the premises we are using are reliable. So whether we can depend on them. So for instance, this argument, Hokkaido is in America, everyone in America speaks English, therefore everyone in Hokkaido speaks English. So this argument is very doubtful. This premise alone is quite strange. We all know that this is incorrect. So we can say it this way. The premise, Hokkaido is in America, is not reliable. In this case, it's not true. We just know that it's not true. But to state it more generally, it's not reliable. All right. So we do not believe the conclusion of an argument with an unreliable premise. So inductive arguments relate to this problem of reliability. So let's say we have this scenario. Aiko says that all Canadians are mean. Aiko just broke up with her Canadian boyfriend. Aiko says she was never treated well by him, and he never gave her flowers. Okay, first off, what's our conclusion? Our conclusion is here. All Canadians are mean. And everything else is used to support this conclusion. At the same time, what do we know about Eichel? 
The answer is that what we know about Aiko is that she just broke up. So what we know about Aiko is that she just broke up with her Canadian boyfriend. This is to say that she has a strong bias. There are many things that she might say that do not match with what one would hope to say in these circumstances. Moreover, her evidence is weak. She's only looking at one person. She's not talking about many other Canadians and what they've done for her. She's saying this one person is terrible. And from that saying, all Canadians are terrible. So, we do not find her argument convincing, so we don't accept the conclusion. Second one. Jane says, I know my body, I feel better when I take allergy medicine, therefore I don't have stomach cancer. As always, task one, find the conclusion. Therefore I don't have stomach cancer. So, okay. so next we find the premises. One, two, I know my body, I feel better when I take allergy medicine, therefore I don't have stomach cancer. So we should ask a few questions here to see whether this is reliable or not. First question, is Jane a doctor? Answer, no. She's not reliable for talking about her own body's state. You need a physician, a doctor, to know if someone is healthy. So we do not believe the conclusion of this argument. We don't accept that regular people know whether or not they have cancer. That's what we need doctors for. So what are some of the ways that we can make things better and stronger? The first one is that we can look at one rule. And this rule is going to be this. Use multiple examples. Strength in numbers, we could say. The more, the merrier. The more examples we use, the stronger and more probable our conclusion becomes. So here's a sample inductive argument. The first time I came to Asaikawa, it snowed. The second time I came to Asaikawa, it snowed. The third time I came to Asaikawa, it snowed. Therefore, it snows a lot in Asaikawa. So we have one, two, three, four. This is our conclusion. And we have three data points that support this conclusion. An inductive argument builds on experience to reach its conclusion. This experience can be direct or indirect. So it can be things that I have seen or things that I have collected in some other way. The conclusion is a generalization. So we're taking something like this, 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 and we are making a statement about the whole. So in this case, it snowed once, it snowed twice, it snowed three times, it snows a lot. Again, an inductive argument shows whether its conclusion is likely or not. And inductive arguments are strong or weak. Strong here means that it is able to convince. Let's look at a second sample inductive argument. This one's a little bit weaker. The first time I came to Asaikawa, it snowed. Therefore, it snows a lot in Asaikawa. So now this has become our conclusion. Why is this weaker? Simple answer is that now we're going from one to the whole. Whereas before, we went from three to the whole. So again, now we're going from one data point to talking about all of us like all and what the weather's like all the time. Before, we were looking at three. So we've changed the amount of data, it's gone down, which means that we have made the argument weaker. Let's look at a sample inductive argument three. The first time I came to Asaikawa it snowed, the second time I came to Asaikawa it snowed, the third time I came to Asaikawa it snowed, the fourth time I came to Asaikawa it snowed, the fifth time I came to Asaikawa it snowed, the hundredth time I came to Asaikawa it snowed, therefore it snows a lot in Asaikawa. So, we've increased the amount of data a lot. This strengthens our conclusion significantly. Let's look at this. First argument, snowed once, snowed twice, snowed three times, and we want to claim Asaikawa equals snow. Maybe we can do this. Maybe it's weak. Second time, it's very weak. We now have only one dot, and we want to make this claim that it snows in Asaikawa. It's not a very good argument.
Again, with three dots, better argument. Now with a hundred dots. At this point, the argument seems very plausible. We've shown there's many reasons to accept this argument. Rule. The more examples we have, the stronger our inductive argument. So if we have two arguments, we have one, we have three things, and we have one where we have five. Everything else being equal, this is stronger support than this is. So this is the weaker. Now, when I say everything else being equal, let's immediately look at what can make things unequal. So, next rule, use a representative sample. So, I'm going to show you a few different Japanese words and talk about how good of a fit I think these words are for the concept. So, I think the best phrasing is daihyou sample. Also, reigai mono de wa nai. I wouldn't say tenkei tekina or dairijin. These are not good examples of representatives. I don't mean a giin. I don't mean someone that works in the House of Representatives. What I mean is a sample that mirrors the data set as a whole. I mean, if we grab something random, it's the same as the sort of data that we're looking at. So this is a representative sample. So what does that look like? I think it's easiest to show you with a few graphs. So, let's say that I have all these data points. Let's say I want to say something about all these data points. So if I try to use this data point up here as a sample, this is not very representative. So we have this large amount of data down here. And we have this one data point over here. So if we can figure out why it's different, in this case it's red, these are blue, that's enough for us to know we shouldn't use it as our first sample. If we're just going to take one sample, I'd much prefer that we take this one. Why? Because it's able to represent. It's able to stand in for all of these samples. It's roughly in the middle of them. So I'll give you another example. So let's say I'm looking at this data set. If I only look here, this is not good enough. Daihyo ni tatanai. Because there's all these things I'm ignoring. If I only look here, Again, not good enough, all these things that I'm ignoring. If I can only pick one data point, this one seems to be about the best. Ideally, though, we want to pick data that can tell us about other data. We want to work with all of these things together. In text, I want to explain it one more time. A representative sample is one that helps for what you want to know. We can't use red to talk about blue. We can't use red to talk about red and blue, unless there's something bigger that merges them together. We also can't use blue to talk about red. If we want to split them and say things about red, we can pick a representative sample for red, or vice versa. If we want to talk about blue, we can pick a representative sample for blue. So, we can test whether something is representative or not. So everyone in my house can speak English. Therefore, everyone in Japan can speak English. What do we think? So clearly this is not representative. My house is different. My wife and I speak English as our first language. Most of you don't. Next sentence. Most people in Hokkaido are Japanese by nationality. Most Japanese by nationality speak Japanese. Therefore, most people in Hokkaido speak Japanese. This is going to be a stronger argument. Because the categories match. People in Hokkaido and people who are Japanese by nationality, that's a good representative sample. These things work together well. Finally, most people I know in Asekawa go to HU Asekawa. Therefore, most people in Asekawa go to HU Asekawa. This is going to be not as strong because we know there's more to Asaikawa than H.U. Asaikawa. There's at least another university, there's Iriodai. In addition to that, there are other people who are not students. So every day I leave campus and run into people who are not from the campus. So we can't just make a judgment from this one small spot. So that's roughly like making a judgment over here. 
is that people who are at the campus are a little different than some other people in the town. So here are some key terms for talking about representative samples. The first one is cross-section. The question here is how well does your basis represent the group you want to characterize? So if we're looking at a whole bunch of data, so we have data over here, if we want to pick something that's representative, we're going to have to take just part of the data. But, whether we take that data from A, C, or E is going to matter a lot to what we're doing. So we want to pick something that's in the right area, that matches the rest of what we're doing. And the second thing, sample size. Do you have enough data to draw your conclusion? So the bigger the sample, the better the sample. So we want more data. So are there enough data points for us to say anything? So for instance, I can't talk about all houses in Asahikawa from my own house. It's not a good cross-section, it's not a large sample size. Other thing, sample source. How did we find this data? The data's origin, is it good, is it not good? So if I just ask my friends, this is a bad data origin. If I get the data from others, this is a good data origin. So again, cross-section. So if we have all these things, where are we going to take data from? If we take data from here, we will draw conclusions about this area, but they're not good enough. If we take data from here, we will draw very different conclusions, even though both are about red. Sample size. If I sample just one thing, I'll be here. If I sample five things, I might be here. So depending on how much data I use, the results can change. So again, sample size. The more points that we take, the better the results we can get. Our goal is a randomized cross-section, which means that what we want to do is we want to use a representative sample. So it is stated in Japanese, We want to generalize from things that add up. We don't want to do things that are random. Finally, one thing that we want to do is we need to consider background rates. So, if we're looking at data like this, we need to figure out whether the one point that we're looking at looks anything like the other data we want to talk about. So if I want to talk about red, this is probably the single worst data point to use. If I want to talk about red, this is probably the best area to use, and maybe this might be the best data point, or this might be the best data point is if we have limited ability, we need to figure these things out as quickly as we can. So generalizations only make sense against the background. So we always bring with us background knowledge. So for instance, Malaysia Airlines is not a safe airline because of MH370. This was a plane that disappeared into the Indian Ocean. But we also need to ask a very important question if we're going to say something like this. That question is this, what is the normal rate of plane loss? Next one, Dr. K speaks English, so white people speak English. So we need to think, is there anything about Dr. K that would make him non-representative of all white people? So there are plenty of other types of white people. So this will be our question, but is Dr. K representative of all white people? Japanese people have a hard time learning English. So the claim goes. But, we need to ask, is this problem singular to Japanese people? Do Koreans and others have similar difficulties? If they do, then maybe we shouldn't say Japanese people. Maybe we should just say many people. If they don't, we could also ask, do all Japanese people have this problem, or do only some Japanese people have this problem? So, today we looked at generalizations, ipanka. And we learned three rules. We learned to use a representative sample, we learned to use more examples, and we learned to consider background rates. These are all very similar ideas. All of this is so that we can try to make strong inductive arguments. So again, deductive arguments, valid, invalid. Inductive arguments, strong, weak. And we're just trying to figure out how we can make our inductive arguments as strong as possible. 
So thank you for listening. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to ask them in class or to leave a comment on the YouTube videos.